we have to ask ourselves that question, what is in our hearts? What is in our hearts? How do we balance that? How do we balance that? When I was in 10th to 11th grade, in between 10th and 11th grade, that summer I went to youth camp like um, some of you are maybe here, right in between 10th to 11th grade, and you're at youth camp. That's where I was at. I would go to youth camp, and it was, uh, it was a great youth camp. I was feeling it. You know what I mean? You know when you're feeling youth camp, and it's just like, this is the best thing ever? We made our way till that last, the same kind of thing, that last full day of camp. That's the best day, and it's the worst day at camp. It's the best day because you've had those chances to get comfortable, build relationships. You feel like you kind of hit your youth camp stride, and it's like, this is great. But it's the worst day because you realize this is it. I've got to make the most of this moment. It's the last day, time for like the afternoon activities and the regular experiences and those kinds of things. And I've got to make this click. It has to happen. So it was the last day at camp. Things had built up, and things were exciting. It was my last chance to think about making a change, my last chance to, to figure things out, my last chance to make sure that a certain girl I had been smiling at the entire week had like actually noticed me. You know, all of the important things in life, exactly. Just being honest with you, it was my last chance. Camp was led by this guy um, who looked like Chuck Norris. His name was Pastor Greg, and it was, uh, he had done a fantastic job putting together a youth camp that was just wonderful. The speaker, the worship team, they were rocking it. We came into the last night of camp, and everything was ready, the last rally, and, and, and the worship team had just excelled. There were some guys from Bethany um, Bible College at the time, now Kingswood or whatever it's called, okay, that place in Canada, right? They, they had led um, worship, and they had done this thing. There was one guy there who was kind of crazy, and uh, during every song, he would just start going, ooh, ooh. Ooh, and I don't know why, but that just, it excited me. And so I just, I, we were all ooh, 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 king, yeah, like for the entire like song. And so you're singing like some kind of like really meaningful song and you're trying to throw in ooh, ooh, ooh and it, it doesn't work, but it's okay. I was feeling it. It doesn't matter. It was good. God's presence was there. Things were rolling. I was feeling wonderful and it, I couldn't dodge it. The moment came. What I had been born to do became clear to me. God laid a call upon my heart. He said, it is time for you to realize and focus, make it real, take the steps. I'm calling you to ministry. Answer this call. This is who you are. And it's not just something you need to say yes to. It's time for you to make sure that your life starts to add up to that call. The decisions you make, the person you are, all of those important things, who you are in school, who you are to your family, who you are to life, it's time for those things to fall in line with that call. Because if you're going to answer my call, it's not just you saying to me, Justin, saying to God, yes, okay, I'll do this. It's you making your life line up to that call to say, okay, God, I am going to do this. Here you can see it. So that call was placed on my life, and I felt it, and I knew it. And, and I, maybe for the first time in my life, I knew who I was supposed to be, and it felt good. It felt right. Even though I had insecurities and other things in life and puberty and all those kinds of things, whatever, I felt strong. I didn't care that I was a teenager. I felt right. This was who I was meant to be. This is what my life was supposed to be about. Here we go. What a great night, right? What a great night of camp. I can remember it so clearly. Everything was great. It was just like that, boom. I'll do, ever what, I'll do anything you ask, God. Boom. There it was. But the truth is, my night didn't end at camp that, at that moment. The camp night wasn't over. No, see, this was the last night at camp. You can't just like end after the rally. You've got to like make the most of this entire night, right? You've got to do what you can do. So for the last night at camp, a group of us with our counselors decided we were going to take this walk up to this cross. See, this camp was called Jamonville. Ignore that, okay? Um, but but it, had this, it had this huge kind of mountain thing by it, okay? A mountain thing's like a big hill, but bigger, all right? And so there was this mountain on campus, and on top of the mountain, there was this large cross, this huge white cross that could be seen by like three states and multiple counties in Pennsylvania and that kind of thing. And so it had this huge cross there, and so we were going to take this, this walk, this hike up to the cross, and it was going to be special and wonderful, like it's the good spiritual ending. It's like our little journey in Exodus, you know, just like they had in the Bible, only we have ours to the cross on the hill, and it was going to be the best. And I was smart, you know how smart I was? I made sure that when I, my group went up to the cross, it was with that other girl that I was talking about. You know, the smiley girl, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, made sure that was happening. And so I slipped over close to her, and on the walk up, just did the little, like, slip my hand over, grabbed hers. Oh, bam, yes. All of a sudden, this is the best night of camp. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, it was good before, it's better now. You know what I'm saying? Like, this, is, this is it. 
this is camp. And so we got this walk in the dark up to the cross holding hands. And you get up to the cross, and it was, it was just the best thing ever. It was like Jesus' spirit was there. There's this, it's dark everywhere. The cross is there. It's lit up white, and you're just like, whoa, what's going on? And if you stood at the right place, the lights would hit the cross, and the cross would block some of the light so it would light up, but the rest of the light would flood the rest of the sky. And so you look up at the sky, which was dark, ex- except it would light up then, except there would just be this dark cross on the sky where the shadow was being blocked. You know, the light was being blocked by the cross itself, and it was creating this wonderful shadow on the sky. And it was like God was just there, and it was wonderful. And of course, I'm thinking nothing about that, right? Okay? Because I've got a hand in my hand, and pfft, whatever. <laughs> <All right. Yeah. laughs> I don't care about any of that spiritual stuff. All right, yeah, this is the moment, right? And I can still remember it very clearly. We're there holding hands. We're, we're enjoying this moment. I'm trying to act all like, oh, yeah, this is great. All right, you know, everything's wonderful. Holding that hand. And I can remember looking over at my counselor. He was this um, student from IWU, okay, Indiana Wesleyan University. I can remember looking over at him, catching his eye for a second. And I... I I'm telling you, I feel like he did this on purpose, all right? He, like, kind of looked at me, made eye contact, and then purposely just looked the other way. And it was like he gave me the invitation, you know what I mean? So I quickly, like, I got, like, three seconds to make this happen. I turn over, and I lean in, you know what I'm saying? All right? She's thinking the same thing. We lean in. And it was that night that I like to consider, maybe not really true, but like to consider I had my first kiss right there. Yeah. Up on the hill by the cross. Yeah, let's applause. No, let's not applause. I don't know. <laughs> It was, it was so great. It was so great. I mean, it lasted about, I don't know, like 0.3 seconds. Um, it was really a lot more wetter than I expected it to be. Uh, I, yeah, I just remember like feeling like, do I like wipe my mouth now or do I like wait till she's not looking? Like just, I don't, I didn't really want all that. All right, but, but there it was. It had happened, and I can just remember the whole night just like, you know what I'm talking about? Like you're not necessarily skipping, but you're really just kind of like, The world has come together. This is the best. This is the best. That's right, though. That night, that night, the night I was called into ministry is the night I like to really consider that I had pretty much my first real kiss. Can you believe that? The night I was called into ministry and God moved in my life like that is the night that I had my first kiss. Can that even happen? Is that biblically, like scripturally, spiritually even allowed? Like, is that how life is supposed to work? Can that happen? To be truth, I don't know. I just know it happened. And I know it was real. And I know my call into ministry was completely real, even though that happened later. And honestly, I don't think there was necessarily anything wrong with that happening, although I'm not encouraging you to make that happen tonight at camp, okay? But what I'm saying is, I I don't think it was necessarily bad. I think that's just... I think it's just life. Do you know what I'm saying? I think it's just how life works. This is life. You are here at camp right now, and let's be honest, you're feeling the same thing. You love camp. You love it for the chance to grow closer to God, but you also love it because there is that slight chance for awkward romance, and that's not bad, too. And so you have to ask yourself, how do I, how do I mix this? To me, this is real and true. And even though you're at the age where hormones are going crazy, let me be honest, this doesn't change as you grow older. The natural urges and desires, both physically and both those of the heart and the spiritualness, you somehow have to figure out how to balance those things together. How to be a Christian and give it all to Jesus Christ, but be a real human being at the same time. How to realize that you're going to have urges and desires and things that are not bad. They are normal. They are a part of life. It is who we are. It's who God made us to be. And they are healthy and natural in the right ways. And you've got to figure out how do I be, how do I become this person who is both Christian but human at the same time? How can I be that person? And in a world that we live in, let's just be honest, with the things that are thrown in front of us all the time, you cannot get away from it. I believe, it's probably honestly true, that there's no way for anybody here not to see some form of pornography or something. And pornography, I mean, how do you even describe what that is? You can see it on a billboard on the highway. You're gonna see that. And so it's just like, how do you as a person balance the fact that those things are there and they're going to be there and you're gonna have natural thoughts and desires and things? 
How do you do that and be a Christian at the same time? Live it out, be the right person, make the right decisions, and most importantly, as we're talking this week, walk in love. How do you do that? To me, the answer is very simple. This is a problem of our hearts. And the only way to make sure our hearts and minds stay focused in the right place is to answer that problem with love. We answer that problem with love. The battle begins in our hearts and in our minds. And it starts with how we're going to view and think about the world. To me, this is why Jesus tells us very clearly the two things you need to do to love God, to love your neighbors. Because if love is who you are, this battle is already won. See, if love is in your heart, you can survive this. You can thrive you're going to have this struggle, but if your heart says love, first and foremost, if love rules your thoughts, I believe you've got it covered. The internet, your relationships, sex, television, pornography, social media, if love comes first, your actions will be ruled by that love and nothing else. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It doesn't mean you're not going to stumble every once in a while, but in the end, if love is really, truly who you are, the stage is set for you to succeed and to win. Love wins. Nothing can top love because God is love. And we know that very clearly. Let me remind you about what Luke 6.45 says again. A good, produ- a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. If you are good, if good is in your heart, if love is there, that is what is going to come forth. It's just the way the world works. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. Just the opposite is the same. What you say flows from what is in your heart. I cannot stress how important this is. The New Testament makes it very clear how important the heart is. In a story that has often been difficult to me and often misunderstood, and I'm sometimes kind of like, why is this story in the Bible? I don't know, but it's there. In Acts chapter 5, we see one of the most difficult moments in the Bible. It's, it's kind of scary. It is about this couple, Ananias and Sapphira. This couple sold a piece of land, and they decide the church is doing this thing where it's growing, and they need money, and people were leading, and they're selling stuff and helping those who are poor and taking care of each other, and the church is becoming a church for the first time, and it's becoming awesome. And so Ananias and Sapphira are part of that church, and they decide they're going to sell, sell some land, and they're going to give some of that land, uh, or some of the money they get from that land, to the church. And what they actually decide is they, they're going to, they want to give it all, but they really don't want to give it all, because they're really concerned about how they, are lo- they look. So what they decide is, even though they're, they want to do a good thing, what they decide is they're going to, ready for this, they're going to take that money from that land, they're going to take a little bit for themselves because they, they sort of want some of that cash, but they want to make it look like they're doing the best thing, so they're going to give all of this other money to the church, which is great, which is wonderful. What they're doing in that sense is totally fine. It's their land, it's their money. They could keep it all if they wanted. They could give it all. They could disperse it out into 45 different directions. It doesn't matter. It's theirs. God didn't necessarily say you've got to give it all. They are totally fine, but the problem is, is they decide they're worried about how they look. There's something wrong happening in their hearts that's not right and so what they do is they decide we're gonna we're gonna pull a little bit back for ourselves we're gonna give the rest but we're gonna tell the world tell everybody that we're giving it all because we want to look good we want to look like we're making the right step and decision so they do just that they sell it they take some money for themselves and they give some to the church and they tell the church that they're giving all of the money that that was all the money that we got The Bible tells us that when Ananias goes to give the money to the disciples, he is questioned about the cash. And he says that it's it's everything. The Bible tells us that Peter calls him on that. And immediately, this is the crazy part, the Bible says immediately Ananias drops dead on the ground. The Bible tells us they remove his body and his wife Sapphira comes in. Peter questions her, excuse me, Sapphira, is this all of the money from the land? She says, yes, it is. And in the same spot, basically, where they just removed her husband's body, she drops dead as well. I I hear this, and it kind of scares me. And it's, it's one of those things that's just like, what is going on? 
But the message is very clear. What happens in your heart matters. And with God, there's no messing around about that. What happens in your heart matters. We get an interesting look in Acts chapter 5, verse 11. It says, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. Can you imagine being in the church, having these two people drop dead? You very quickly do a self-check of your heart. What am I doing? Am I right? Am I good? Is this set? Is everything fine? Because you have just been scared like nothing else you've ever experienced in your life. Things got real. You better believe it. The message to that church was clear. Get your heart right. The consequences are clear. Get your heart right. When you get your heart right, it all comes together. Life is just right. I don't know about you, but when I've done something wrong, there is like this eternal, internal sickness, unhappiness, unsettledness within myself. I feel not right. I can't put it into words. I feel weighted, jaded, disappointed, heavy. It feels off in here somewhere, and I don't like it. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't like it. I, I just, I can't describe it to you. It's not a physical pain. I just feel unbalanced, and I want it to go away. I want it to go away. The good news is if, if you ever feel that way when you've done something stupid, when you've done something wrong, I believe that your heart is probably in the right direction because love is there. It may not have control of your life totally, but a part of you and probably the biggest part of you is saying, this isn't right. This isn't good. Make a change. You're, this isn't what you're supposed to be. That's a good thing because truth is, it, the bad news is that if you don't ever feel that way when you do something wrong, what does that say about your heart? There is a big imbalance there. And love may not be playing a big part of who you are, what kind of decisions and person you've become. When your heart is right, when love is in control, you can be yourself. You can be confident with your actions. Even if others don't understand, even if they misread you, even if they act against you, it doesn't matter. Your heart is right. You feel right. Fight for that. When your heart is right, fight for that. The Holy Spirit works that way. He works in among us. And those things that we, as we grow closer to God, if there are things that are wrong in our life, he will work in our life and he will begin to change us. That is how he works. But what we have to do is we have to make sure we get our heart right. Love has to be the driving factor. So the last question for us this morning is how do you make that happen? How do you get your heart into the right position? How do you make sure that love rules your heart? If you're writing notes, these are the things to write down right now. How do you make sure that love rules your life and that your heart is in the right place? The first thing you have to do is you have to train your heart. You have to train your heart. Write that down. If you're writing something down, you have to train your heart. How do you train your heart? First off, you get into God's word. Second off, you surround yourself with other Christians and church opportunities. You immerse yourself into worship, into life, into church, into God's body, into his, into his place, into his family. You get yourself in there, and you immerse yourself in that. I'm going to be honest with, with you right now. Some of you use youth camp every year, and I'm slightly sick of it. I'm just being honest. Now, if this is your first youth camp, ignore what I'm about to say, but some of you use youth camp every year, and I'm slightly sick of it. You act like this is the only place where you can get closer to God. You identify with this place, and and you act like like this is is just some special place. And trust me, I understand how special it is. Duh, I've been doing this for 10 years, whatever. This is, I, I love this, okay? But you act like this is the only place where that can happen. Get over it. Stop it. Stop waiting for youth camp to make a life change, to connect with God, to think this is the only place where wonderful things can happen. That's garbage. Stop it. Grow up a little bit. 
Understand that maybe you have an identity here, maybe you have a place here, but I get tired of seeing people on Facebook because like they can't come to camp or something. It's like, I'm sorry, this is not the only place you can connect with God. You should be doing that every week of your life, at least on Sunday or Saturday night or somewhere Wednesday night, whatever it is, find that place and connect. And if your church isn't that, make it that. You can do that. You want the truth? Sometimes we're all spoiled turds. It's just the truth. It's time to be real. There are a lot of places you can connect with God, and that's not somebody else's responsibility. That is yours. That is your responsibility. It's time for you to get involved with your church. Don't give me an excuse. Own up. Step up. Walk in love in your church. Cheer up the old people. Smile at the kids. Encourage the pastor. I don't care who they are. Encourage your pastor. Stop being a jerk and encourage them. Get on board. I don't care about the past. Stop being a Debbie Downer. Make a difference in your church. You can do that. You can do that. Do it. As a great man said on the internet just a little bit ago, do it. You know what I'm talking about? Do it. You can do it. Do it. Second thing, write this down. You have to protect your heart. You have to protect your heart. If you want to make sure your heart's in the right place that love rules it, you have to protect your heart. There are two sides to filthy content. First is how it treats the person who is being taken advantage of. So often we dwell on that. Oh, when you look at something bad, think about how you're treating that person, and that's true. But I think we can all make excuses of just like, well, that person wants that, or they're blah, 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 or this isn't really hurting anybody. It's, it's just whatever it is. It's not, it's not really that big of a deal. It's okay. The second part, though, of filthy content is what it does to the person who takes it in, what it does to you when you see it, when you hear it, when you experience it, when you are a part of it. And trust me, that is the part that you should most worry about. What are you doing to your heart? No, for real, what are you doing to your heart? How do you treat your heart? What are you doing to it? What are you shaping it into? What are you filling it with? What are you doing to your heart? It's time for you to be honest about what is good for you and what is not. I'll be honest, I'm sick of seeing some of you hanging around with people who, who shouldn't be making the cut in your life. You know what I'm saying? These people are not up to your grade. I know you're thinking to yourself, I, I'm ministering to them, but they are just dragging you down. It is time to show them the highway. It is time to make the hard decisions for your life, to fill yourself with the right people. Some of you need to... Uh, when you're giving things the highway, some of you need to give television shows, internet sites, social media the highway as well. If you get jollies from your pictures online too far, or if you get jollies from seeing other people's pictures online, it is time to drop that program. It is time to kick it out of your life. You don't need Instagram, you don't need Snapchat, whatever it is, all of those different things, there's a new one every other day, you don't need it. This battle never stops. Don't think that just because you're a teenager, this is over. Just a month ago, I deleted an app off of my phone called Flipboard. It is a simple app that is supposed to bring articles that are related to me, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed reading and discovering the different things that are happening in the world. It was like having a newspaper made just for me. But the truth is, I continually did not like the content. I did not like what it wanted me to see and wanted me to think. And so I made the cut. It hurt. I missed it. But who cares? Who cares? Make the cut. Just make the cut. Don't roll your eyes and think that you can handle it. That's stupid. This is for all of us. Counselors, students, everybody in this room, you can't handle it. Don't tempt yourself. Don't push yourself. Make the cut. It's not that important. Don't be stubborn about it. Get it out of your life. Make the cut. If you need to right now, take out your phone and make a cut, do that. If you need to do it in five minutes because you're worried someone's going to see you making the cut, if you need to do it in five minutes, ten minutes before you go to small group or whatever, do that. Take it out before it's too late. Get it off your phone. 
get it out of your life. If you left your phone at home, that's pretty cool. When you get home, make it your number one priority. Write it on whatever you need to remind yourself. Get home, get there. Make that cut. And every day of your life, be sensitive to the new things that come into your life and be ready to make the cut because you have to protect your heart. The third thing is this. You have to give of your heart. Martin Luther said, I have held many things in my hands and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. Isn't that awesome? Let me say it again. I have held many things in my hands and I have lost them all. But whatever I have placed in God's hands, that I still possess. You want to keep your heart? You've got to give it away. Over and over, give it away. Give away your heart. I don't mean this romantically. That is not what I mean. This is what I mean. You can't be selfish and walk in love at the same time. That's impossible. They are counterproductive to each other. If you want to walk in love, you have to give and you have to serve. Not just once in a while. You have to have a life of giving and serving. This is love. This is walking in love. Some of you need to get over yourselves just a little bit. I know you're a teenager, I know you're just learning and growing and there's all that blah, 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 all that stuff. That's an excuse, age, past, family. I understand they're important, but they're all just things that you are going to use as excuses not to give of yourself and not to serve other people. It's time for you to get over that, to give it away. Remember, you can't hold it all yourself. Give it away and give it to God. Some of you have tough home lives. You know what would make your home life better? Is if you did something about it. I know that's not always easy, not always possible to a big extreme, but contribute at home. Love on your parents. Be kind to your siblings. Make life better. Serve them. You want to be the kind of person who has friends, who has people who, who love and count on them? Then be a friend that gives and serves them. Close your mouth every once in a while and listen to what somebody else has to say. Stop telling them about the great things you have. Listen to what they have. And if they don't have, maybe share something you have with them. And if you don't have time for your friends, then you're probably not going to have time to really have any friends. Be a friend that gives and serves. And if you are that person, you won't have to worry about having friends. They will flock to you. If everybody in Bethany Wesleyan Youth Group the youth group I have the most experience with here, of course, would, would be honest. They would tell you that the most popular people in our youth group, the ones that everybody loves and thinks this person is great, are the ones who give of themselves over and over and over and over again. Be that teenager. Be that young man or woman of God. Give and serve. Listen and care. Open your heart. Be that person, and you can make a difference. No excuses, just give of yourself. On June 16th, 2015, that's two weeks ago on a Tuesday, um, at 4 p.m., I rushed my wife into the hospital. Uh, we, we, uh, she was going to have a baby, um, that's what was happening. So I rushed her in, and we get into a room at, we get there at 4 o'clock, like literally like right at 4 o'clock, and I, I get her into a wheelchair and we're, we were in and the car's like sitting out there. And so she's like in like anger, like not anger mode, but like, like this is serious, like kind of mode, you know what I'm saying? Like this baby is happening kind of situation. And, and she's slightly angry with me because I'm like, uh, someone's going to park that car. Like it's our car. Uh, and I, I'm worried about all the wrong things. Yeah, because I'm a dad and I'm an idiot. All right, so, so I run out and I park the car. I did it quickly. I mean, I'm pretty smooth, okay? I know how to drive a car. So I park it quickly and I get back in and and she's just like, ah, and she's sitting there so great because there was like this young guy who's like sitting across from her and he is doing everything he can to like not be in existence. Like what is going on here? And so I get her and I wheel her up to the floor and we get up there. We get there at four o'clock. They get us into this room, this place they kind of like push us off to at 4.13, okay? The, the, the doctor on the floor who's supposed to deliver the baby comes in and is like, oh, okay, yeah, this is probably going to happen, whatever, in a bit, it's no big deal, okay? The nurse is like, whoa, this, she's for real, serious here, okay? This is like, this is going to happen, but they're like, no, I'll be back in a bit, whatever, the doctor leaves, okay? 
at 4.30, okay, a half hour after we got to the hospital, 15 minutes basically after getting into a room, the nurse delivers the baby, okay? The doctor was nowhere to be seen. His name was Sawyer. He was eight pounds, six ounces. He is awesome, he is sweet, and I love him. He's fantastic. I had a unique experience with Sawyer, though. Because he came so quickly, the hospital wasn't necessarily prepared for us, prepared for this moment. So after he was born, he was cleaned up a little bit. He was given to my wife for a quick second. It was awesome. But then they wanted to make sure that she was okay, and that's awesome. And, and so the nurses started working with her, and, they, and then they left the room to, to prepare a different room for us so that we could have a place to stay. And so they handed me Sawyer to hold. And I, I've always held my kids as soon as I possibly can after they're born, but they seemed to forget that, that I was holding him, and they just left. They left the room, and I didn't have a place to lay him down. And, and Julie was tired, so I just, I just held him. And then 10 minutes passed, and I'm holding him. And 20 minutes passed, and I'm holding him. And 30 minutes passed, and I'm, I'm holding him. And an hour passes, and I'm still just there holding my son. My arm got tired. I started leaning against things, like to just kind of prop up my arm, like awkwardly a bit. I did whatever I could, but, but I kept holding him. I held my beautiful son Sawyer for over two hours, and I didn't regret a moment of it. It hurt, I struggled, my arm cramped, who cares? This is my son, and I'm always gonna look back and remember those first two hours of his life, and how he spent them with me. I was perfect, I was the best. I love him, I love him with all of my heart, and that's all that mattered to me. That's what love does. When love is in your heart, it takes control. Those little preferences, those little things in your life, the things you think you need, whatever to have to exist to be, you realize they're not important. Love is all that matters. When God's love is in your heart, directing your thoughts, driving your actions, being the thing you live and respond and answer with, the world is taken care of. Love has that power with your heart, with it locked in your heart. Walk in love. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would just help each and every one of us to walk in love. Father, help us to be honest if we go to small groups as we spend the rest of the day as whatever happens. Help us just to, to walk in love, to realize that if love reigns in our hearts, those things are they're just not, nothing else is important. Things are taken care of. Father, help us to be honest with our heart. Help us to do what we have to do to just work on our heart, to build it, to train it. Father, help us to take the hard steps to protect our heart. Help us to know that it is of value. Help us to realize it is the greatest treasure we have. Our phones, our computers, our whatever, our clothing, those are not our treasures. Our heart is our treasure. It is the only thing in really in this world that is uniquely ours. It is ours. No one can take it from us. We give it to you. We give it away. It is ours. Help us to protect it. And Father, help us to find ways to give and serve you with our heart. Help us to find ways to just allow it to experience the right kinds of things. Bless us and guide us, Father. Help us to realize how important it is to just work on our heart, keep the right things locked and stored away there. God, we love you. We thank you for today. Help us to walk in love in our world. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.